Good Super afternoon, Bowl. everyone. This is Larry Stevens with the, uh, with the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff. And today's talk is about uh, life in the halls of time, the biogeography of Grand Canyon. It's um, uh, not well known, but the Museum of Northern Arizona has long played a role in understanding and even management of Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, our contributions uh, to, the par to the park have been through long history of, of uh, science research in the park, not only on, on geology and archaeology and, and uh, anthropology, but also in biology, which is the topic of today's talk. Walter McDougall was for uh, many decades the leading botanist on Grand Canyon. He worked here at the Museum of Northern Arizona. Ed, uh, Eddie McKee was the first naturalist of Grand Canyon, started out his career as a, as in biology there at the park and uh, later moved on into geology, played a role here at the museum. And then uh, after about 1970 or so, Steve Carruthers uh, began in investigating the biology of Grand Canyon National Park and played a, a major role actually in a lot of uh, river and uh, park management uh, operations since then. So m and has played, a, played quite a role in, uh, in both our understanding of Grand Canyon and also its, uh, its, its management. Today, what I'd like to do is talk about the distribution of life in Grand Canyon, in part based on some of that history of research. Uh, the topics I'd like to present to you are, uh, have to do with the geography, the physical gradients, the diversity of habitats we have in Grand Canyon, uh, how life is distributed in relation to the landscape, how the landscape shapes, uh, shapes that distribution, and then conservation issues in the region. Grand Canyon falls about the middle of the, of the 1400 mile course of the Colorado River which heads in, uh, in the Wind River Lakes uh, up in green, on the Green River in, Utah, in uh, Wyoming, flowing through Utah, and the upper Colorado River heading in Rocky Mountain National Park. The river uh, meets in south, southeastern Utah, <clears throat> flows down through Lake Powell and into the Grand Canyon region. Uh, from there, it passes into the, it goes across the geologic province of the Colorado Plateau and into the Basin and Range province flowing south into Mexico and eventually into the Sea of Cortez. So uh, Grand Canyon uh, is managed, about two thirds of it's managed by the National Park Service, the other third managed by Native American tribes, BLM, Forest Service, other agencies. Occupies a landscape of uh, land, area, land area of about 2000 square miles. The length of the river in Grand Canyon is about 280 miles. Uh, the volume of Grand Canyon is about 750 cubic kilometers. And uh, so this is, a, this is a very prominent large deep canyon. Not the deepest or longest canyon on earth, but uh, probably the best known, the most, most widely recognized canyon. Grand Canyon is a, a, a landscape of change and change at all different dimensions of time. Of course, the geology is well known, extending back 2 billion years, uh, but um, uh, the, the, the modern biogeography, the modern uh, species and kind of landscape formations that we, we relate as being Grand Canyon began to emerge in a recognizable fashion uh, during the Miocene epoch, about 15 million years or so ago. Since that time, the, uh, the mountain ranges like the Sierra Nevada have risen up and created, created a rain shadow. So during Pliocene times, beginning about a million years ago or so, the landscape began to, uh, to become more desert-like. Uh, prior to that, it was actually quite mesic, looked more like the probably the eastern, uh, southeastern U.S. Um, in late Pliocene time, uh, a very important thing happened. The South America, for the first time in history, touched North America. So at 2.6 million years ago, those, uh, these two continental land masses began to uh, inter interchange flora and fauna. And we have more than 150 uh, genera of plants and animals that are derived from that land bridge connection in our, in our landscape here. Quite a fascinating story. Of course, every, pretty much every statement I'm making here has a book or, uh, or many articles uh, behind it. And the literature on Grand Canyon is so vast that it would take years to read through even, even the, uh, the, the, most, the more, more commonly found uh, articles. It's an enormous volume of, of research that's taken place on Grand Canyon. Um, uh, during Pleistocene times, two million years ago or so, the, uh, um, there were lava flows that dammed Grand Canyon multiple times. And so we had uh, uh, large lakes forming in Grand Canyon. 
and then getting eroded out. So lots and lots of dynamism there. During the, uh, during the more recent times, we've had increasing aridity of the landscape. And uh, we know most about this landscape, uh, as it turns out, by looking at the poop of pack rats. Uh, these are uh, small animals, weigh about a pound or so, uh, pretty vile-tempered little critters, nocturnal. Uh, they always pee on you when, you when you catch them in a live trap uh, to let you know how happy they are to see you. Uh, but they uh, gather material out in front of their burrows and bring it back to the rock shelter that they live in. And, and then they pee on it and it solidifies. And pretty much all that material can be dated and identified. Sometimes those materials date back 50,000 years. The story that they've been able to show us is that our light zones here in Northern Arizona very abruptly moved upslope 3,000 feet, 1,000 meters uh, at the end of the Pleistocene about 12,000 years ago. Again, evidence of, of very dynamic uh, climate-based changes in, in terms of the biota and the landscapes here. So we've got a complex landscape, multiple, multiple ecosystems, long-term geologic history that's affected things. Um, how does Grand Canyon affect the life around it as a landform? And so um, this is a, the subject of, a, of, of uh, some interesting study we've been able to, to get through here at the Museum of Northern Arizona. There are four main ways that Grand Canyon affects life around it. The first is it is it well, for some species, it just doesn't affect gene flow. It doesn't affect, affect uh, population distribution very much. Uh, but for many species in the landscape, it serves as a corridor of low, low elevation desert habitat through the landscape. It also serves as a barrier from upstream downstream and also from the north side to the south side or south side to the north side. Lastly, it, it serves as a, uh, as a, 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 re a refuge in certain microhabitats uh, where isolated rare spring species occur at springs and these other, other um, unique uh, little habitats. There are also some anomalies, uh, biogeographic anomalies. Um, why are there so few termites in Grand Canyon? Why are there no horned lizards on the floor of Grand Canyon? Or uh, or um, uh, kangaroo rats or rabbits on the floor of Grand Canyon. These are common critters everywhere in the Southwest, but they don't occur in Grand Canyon, on the floor of the Grand Canyon. So um, uh, these four ways of affecting life around it and with a few anomalies are, are the subject of the next few, few slides here. So first, the uh, species that are not affected by, by Grand Canyon, as far as we can really understand, are things like lined sphinx moths and ravens and bighorn sheep. These move widely across elevation. Probably uh, the canyon doesn't really represent any major barrier to them at all. Um, think, uh, species like Lydonutria minor here, this little tiny um, mantid that lives on the floor of Grand Canyon and in the surrounding areas, we don't really understand the genetics of this thing well enough to know what effects the canyon plays on it, but it's widespread in the region found across the landscape. So those, those kinds of species are, uh, are taxa that are just not affected by Grand Canyon as a, as a landform. But uh, many, many desert species occur on the floor of Grand Canyon moving all the way up through uh, or partially up through Grand Canyon. <clears throat> those that move, some, some of those move all the way through Grand Canyon all the way up into Utah. So uh, claret cup cacti, this straight, very strange desert plant called the desert trumpet. It's actually a, a buckwheat. Uh, banded gecko, chuckawallas, all are species that use the river corridor as a, as a, a range, uh, as, a, as a way to expand their ranges in the Grand Canyon. Certainly that corridor is also prone to quite a bit of migration. Not so much from songbirds that might be following it, but more for things like water birds, uh, fish and other things. So in some work we've done on, on the uh, bird life in Grand Canyon, water birds are very prominently following that water through the landscape through the, uh, uh, as, a, as a corridor. Six different groups, a uh, couple of raptors, many waders, about 70 species in all of, uh, of water birds using Grand Canyon. The corridor effects also extend to non-native plant species. The river is a, is a movement corridor for the dis dispersal of non-native plants. And um, this is a bit of an issue then because we have planned floods that actually might move uh, non-native plant species into the into Grand Canyon downstream. And uh, ravenna grass is one species that we've worked with the National Park Service to, uh, to eradicate from Grand Canyon. Dan Hall and the uh, Grand Canyon River guys have done a great 
great job in, uh, in keeping that species at bay. It's a, a pretty invasive big grass that has very little habitat value. But overall, um, uh, the, um, uh, the patterns we've seen is that about 11% of the plants in Grand Canyon are not native. This is the same proportion of non-native plants as occurs in the United Kingdom. So that gives you a sense of how invasive, uh, uh, how, how many you know, non-native plant species are, are in the landscape. This is a, you know, a, a pretty wild landscape, but still 11% of the plant species are non-native. Non-native animal diversity and plant diversity also is, is, is highest, sorry, where um, uh, in, in places that are most species rich. This is very peculiar. These are different ecosystems in Grand Canyon. The pattern of non-native species pretty much matches the pattern of native species in those landscapes. So that's quite puzzling. Many, uh, uh, in many situations, like the river corridor, disturbed landscapes are, are very favorable to, to non-native plant uh, invasion. And the same is true in that river corridor supports uh, most of our native plant species. So the, the patterns are, are quite, uh, quite similar. Um, and that's a, a bit uh, non-intuitive. All right, so the corridor, uh, corridor functions are, uh, are various, uh, interesting to look at. There are also very strong barrier effects. So in Grand Canyon, we don't have any saguaro cactus. You know, there's the, uh, the uh, state flower of, of Arizona is, the, is a saguaro cactus flower. We don't have that species here, nor do we have uh, Joshua tree occurring in Grand Canyon or Palo Verde or a whole host of common Southern desert species that can't persist in Grand Canyon. And the reason they probably can't move upstream up into the, up into the canyon is because the, the, uh, uh, we have a phenomenon called cold air subsidence. The winters on the floor of, of Grand Canyon are very cold, and these succulent plants can't really tolerate long-term uh, long exposure to cold. And therefore, that, uh, that unique feature of our climate keeps those species out of the landscape. Uh, many people have heard about the kaibab squirrel isolated on the north rim from the tasselared squirrel in the south rim. These species are separated in a north-south fashion, and they don't, don't occur uh, they don't. Uh, they no longer co-occur. Therefore, the kaibab squirrel has become a unique subspecies. It's a color morph of this overall uh, Cyrus aberdi species. Uh, also, we have species that that uh, live up on the rims but can't get across. The Grand Canyon ringlet butterfly is one of those. It lives only on the south rim. It's got about a, about a 50 mile long uh, range that is just along the rim but it cannot occur, it uh, cannot um, fly across the canyon. It is completely restricted to this narrow strip of rim habitat. So the rim, again, is a, a kind of a unique refugium for this, for this species. So the barrier effects are quite strong. They work uh, uh, both across the canyon and in an up-down fashion on the, on the, uh, uh, in the river corridor. In terms of unique species occurring in Grand Canyon at Refugia, we have a, a unique Grand Canyon pink rattlesnake, a plant called uh, Aaron's, Aaron Ross's Euphorbia, the century milk vetch, a plant called McDougal Slaveria, a great big shrub that we discovered at, uh, in uh, the mid 1970s, uh, occurring oil, only at springs in Grand Canyon, the mass club skimmer dragonfly, uh, the only breeding population in, uh, in the US is, is found at about half a dozen spring fed streams in Grand Canyon, and then, uh, and also a, a Yavapai talus snail. These are some of the unique species, not by any means all of them. We have uh, several dozen unique species in Grand Canyon. But what's interesting about this whole group of species is they all occur in, the, in that isolated Eastern basin. The only one that crosses the boundary is uh, McDougal Slaveria, and that lives only in the boundary area. So uh, that boundary has really a, uh, played a strong role in isolating species and allowing uh, endemism to take place in Grand Canyon. But these are kind of classic uh, uh, refuge species in our, in our landscape. Now, if we tally all this stuff together, look at the quarter barrier refuge and uh, null effects on all the species we've got in Grand Canyon. Um, these, are, uh, these are rough numbers, obviously, because it's, uh, it's an ongoing process to discover um, how, the, how the canyon is affecting them. But, looking at a wide array of, of organisms from plants to land, snail, land snails, tiger beetles, butterflies, mosquitoes, fish, uh, the herpetofauna, the reptiles and amphibians, the birds and the mammals, looking at a total of about 2,400 2, species. 
we can see that about one third of, of them, one third, one thirty-four percent of them are affected by the canyon as a corridor. An equal effect is uh, equal number is affected uh, is not affected really by the canyon. Uh, the barrier effects also very strong. About a quarter of the species affected uh, by being excluded from some uh, either north north rim, south rim, or coming up into the canyon or going down. And then a smaller percentage are ref, uh, refuge uh, refugial species in the landscape. So corridor effects are about equal to null effects, slightly greater than barrier effects, and uh, those are greater than the refuge effects. But the overall, overall, about two thirds of Grand Canyon species are affected by uh, by it as a landscape. So that's a rather large proportion of the, of the species in the landscape that are affected by Grand Canyon as a as a landscape feature, because land uh, large deep canyons haven't really been investigated anywhere else on Earth. This is kind of interesting information. So now I'm going to step through what some of those, uh, what, what some of the bi biodiversity actually is here. We've done a lot of work on a whole bunch of the insect groups here. Just finished up a book on the dragonflies of Grand Canyon. If you're interested in that, get a hold of me. Um, but uh, we have men, we have about 90 species of dragonflies in the Grand Canyon region. These are high mobility species, uh, but nonetheless, we still have one endemic and one rare species up on the. Uh, up in the North Rim and other rare species that come in uh, that are kind of regionally rare showing up in the landscape. Uh, this Apache, uh, this uh, mass club skimmer dragonfly uh, that we discovered in Grand Canyon occurs only uh, in, in the Eastern Basin at perennial spring fed streams. And that's kind of an interesting thing to be able to document. In terms of butterflies, we've got about 140 butterfly species in, in the Grand Canyon region. Five of those are unique to the landscape. So therefore about three, three to four percent of the of the butterflies in the landscape are, are unique. There also are subtle color differences for many of the species that occur in Grand Canyon. Uh, and so those color differences could amount at, at uh, some time in the future to, to additional endemic subspecies typically. The reason we don't have more unique species of butterflies in Grand Canyon has to do with a relatively short time that this landscape has been a desert. Remember that uh, 12,000 years ago, we had uh, uh, ice age conditions, and 12,000 years is not really uh, much uh, sufficient time for development of full scale uh, species differences. So, for the endemic species we do have in Grand Canyon, that's quite interesting. Most of those are subspecies, uh, and and uh, uh, that the reason for that is because we simply haven't had enough duration of fully isolated time under a constant climate. All right, so uh, butterflies are a great source of our biodiversity. Um, and moving on then to fish, um, got eight native fish species in Grand Canyon. However, because of the impacts of Glen Canyon Dam, which will be our next talk on the 3rd of August, um, about half of those species have been decimated, uh, removed from the, uh, from, from the Colorado River, leaving us with, with only four native species. Um, we note, though, that there are 20 non-native fish species that have been introduced and are breeding in Grand Canyon. That's a, a large reason why we suspect some of these native fish have, have gone extinct here. All right. In terms of the uh, reptiles and amphibians in the landscape, 49 species. Uh, again, the corridor effects are stronger than the barrier effects, stronger than refuge effects. Here, they're stronger than the null effects. So taxa like horned lizards, don't occur on the floor of Grand Canyon. There's a very strong barrier effect uh, with those. But if you were to stand on this, uh, this is a kind of a, if you were to stand at Lee's Ferry looking downstream, looking at the South Rim, uh, the Inner Canyon, the River Corridor, the Inner Canyon on the North and North Rim, and then looking at uh, lower, um, uh, lower middle upper elevations as you, as you move through there, you'd see that most of our herpetofauna are focused in the River Corridor. And more of more species as you move downstream towards that, uh, you know, the landscape in the Sonoran and, and uh, Mojave Desert in the east in the western basin of Grand Canyon, very well enriched with 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 reptiles. So that's where we find most of our species, including things like Gila monsters and, and five species of rattlesnakes and whatnot that don't occur in the uh, in the upper basin. But nonetheless, it's a pretty rich uh, pretty rich fauna. Thirty eight percent of the of the fifty eight species here are excluded by barrier effects. So that's kind of a very strong barrier, barrier uh, impact here in terms of birds. Uh, this gets pretty exciting. We've got a, uh, about three hundred and thirty bird species in the Grand Canyon region. This is about one third of the 
of the entire fauna of the US, long history of bird research in Grand Canyon, some very wonderful publications available by the Grand Canyon Association. Um, and these, uh, uh, that, that shows us that we have quite a few uh, birds coming through the landscape in migration and, um, and, and quite a few very unusual records. Two records of magnificent frigate bird for Grand Canyon, which is incredibly strange. That's a, that's a maritime bird following the water upstream from the Sea of Cortez and, or, and blown off during the storms or whatever. So many very unusual records within that, that bird record. In terms of mammals, uh, about 92 species of mammals recorded in the Grand Canyon uh, region, the immediate region. Uh, large number of rodents, large number of bats uh, and you know, carnivores, quite a few missing species in the carnivores, including grizzly bears and jaguar. But uh, here are three species that are found that are that belong to the raccoon family that are all found in Grand Canyon. Recent records of Kawadi as they're uh, these are uh, Central American raccoon uh, that's moving northward. Uh, we now have a population uh, in Flagstaff and, and uh, one or two records in the Grand Canyon area. So great adventures to be had with tracing how, how climate change is, is affecting the distribution of not only mammals, but also of many species here. In terms of conservation, we've got concerns about quite a few different species in the landscape. About 80 species uh, uh, are of management concern in, in this region. Some of these have, have, have been extirpated, meaning driven to local extinction, even though they're not uh, extinct in the overall landscape. Uh, but uh, quite a few birds are, are of concern. We've lost populations of burrowing owl. California condor is, is, uh, was, uh, was eliminated, but now it's been brought back. So that's, uh, that's good news. But sage grouse, yellow-billed cuckoo, pileated woodpecker, southwestern woodpecker are species lost in the landscape. Quite a few sp uh, species of, of mammals that are, that are um, uh, either in question or gone. Muskrat are just recently uh, showing up back in the, Col in the Colorado River. But uh, Colorado River otter are, appear to be extinct. Jaguar, uh, gray wolf, black bear, Miriam elk are all, are all gone. Of the, of the vertebrates that are in trouble in Grand Canyon, about uh, uh, nearly one third of them, more than a quarter of them are, are birds. And things like burrowing owl, sage grouse, yellow-billed cuckoo, pileated woodpecker, and southwestern wolf flycatcher have been lost from, from Grand Canyon. California condor, kind of an interesting story there because it was, it got right down to the edge of extinction. It was brought back by a very um, extraordinary conservation effort be released into the environment. We've now got almost 80 birds flying in the in the Grand Canyon landscape and breeding too. Some of them are breeding occasionally. So quite a quite an array of stories there, uh, but uh, but uh, quite a few species in the landscape that are that are at risk. Some of those uh, recently lost from the system are northern leopard frog. This is yerba manza, a culturally important plant uh, that grew in just one population. Uh, willow flycatcher was an endangered bird. Its habitat has, has been uh, uh, under um, continuous kind of transition with the invasion of non-native plants and is now ex uh, extirpated from Grand Canyon. And then uh, this extraordinary story of the Colorado pike minnow, a two meter long, six foot long, seven foot long uh, minnow species that was a predator in the mainstream. It migrated from the lower Colorado River Basin all the way up into the upper Colorado River Basin to, to spawn apparently each year. And uh, that the, the imposition of dams and, uh, and water control structures throughout the basin have prevented that migration. It's restricted now just to a few streams in the upper basin. Um, that is a species that uh, would be well worth bringing back into Grand Canyon and actually could probably do pretty well. As a predator, we have other fish issues that really need to be balanced, but uh, National Park Service is, is, um, is playing a, a very important role here in, in uh, supporting these thoughts and, and uh, eventually we may get Colorado pike minnow back into the river system. The good news is that uh, in many cases, species that have been uh, lost in the landscape have been returned and, uh, and restored. Uh, California condor, the story I just mentioned, uh, really a tremendous conservation effort that started with the Clinton administration and Bruce Babbitt's, um, uh, under Bruce Babbitt as Secretary of the Interior, bringing that bird back in. Uh, and the increase in, in, uh, in fledgling success is really in, uh, inspiring there. Still very subject to mercury poisoning though, so we have to be careful with that. Bald eagle and peregrine falcon were both on the endangered species list. Both have been delisted. 
Grand Canyon uh, supports wintering populations of bald eagle and the largest population of nesting peregrine falcons anywhere in the 48 states. So it's really a great, uh, great thing to see those things uh, back in the landscape. There's an effort to support, to, to bring back black-footed ferret, uh, once called America's rarest mammal. Uh, it's, it's a species that's being uh, released in prairie dog towns just south of Grand Canyon. And, uh, and we hope those efforts uh, are successful. Humpback chub is a species of, of fish that has uh, received a lot of attention in, in Grand Canyon and the population in Grand Canyon is doing quite well. So that's, that's been quite a uh, conservation success story there as well. So uh, in some cases, species missing from the landscape have been brought back in and, uh, and are being restored. So that's really uh, tremendous kudos to the National Park Service for doing such a great job with that. So re re remembering uh, all that we've talked about here and the conclusions, it's very safe to say that Grand Canyon is, probably, is the best known large deep canyon on the planet. And, and that uh, is, um, uh, it's not the deepest canyon or the longest canyon uh, on earth, but it's, it's the best known. It's becoming ecologically and uh, evolutionarily known as well. That. It's obvious that its geologic history and the complex ecological gradients of light and elevation have created a unique set of ecosystems in this landscape. And uh, the presence of those ecosystems and their health being protected by Grand Canyon National Park affects the present day biodiversity in the landscape. We've talked then about four impacts of Grand Canyon as a large deep canyon feature on the distribution of species in this landscape. Corridor effects are about equal to the null effects. Uh, and those are slightly greater than the barrier effects and the refuge effects. But those four processes have shaped gene flow and the, and the distribution of species in the landscape in a very, uh, very specific way. Species uh, losses are taking place and there are ongoing threats. We fortunately have this landscape protected by the National Park Service and buffering lands uh, protected by the National Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management and Native American tribes. So we are uh, limiting some of the threats there in the landscape, but it takes co constant public vigilance to, to make sure that we protect the, the uh, species and the natural environments in, land, in Grand Canyon. So stay on your toes with your, with your, public att with your attention to, to Grand Canyon. And the good news is if we do things well, we can recover populations that have been at risk. So that's really great news and, and, uh, and Grand Canyon is a, is a landscape uh, that uh, supports recovery of, of some of these missing species. What I've talked about today is available in a, in a paper that I wrote in 2012 on the biogeography of large deep canyon. Google on the phrase large deep canyon and you, you, you'll get the, you can download that paper for free. So your questions and comments are most welcome. Um, note that our next presentation in, on the Grand Canyon uh, coming from the Museum of Northern Arizona will be on the 3rd of August at 3 p.m. I'll talk then about uh, the impacts of Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado River ecosystem in Grand Canyon. And with that, we can take any questions. Thank you, Larry. I'll, I'll give people a moment um, to chime in with some questions, um, but uh, and I'm gonna throw in a question of, of my own. I was very curious about the, um, the ringlet butterfly that I oh, yeah. believe you said could fly for 50 miles, but didn't cross the canyon. <laughs> Yeah, so um, some species have apparently uh, agoraphobia, which is the fear of open spaces. And this butterfly lives just on the south rim of Grand Canyon. The, its range extends for 50 miles. How far an individual butterfly actually flies would be a wonderful uh, uh, research study, but we haven't done that yet. But nonetheless, the range is very much prescribed by being just on the rim of Grand Canyon. and it does not fly over the rim. It will, it will not fly out over the rim. And it's a, it's a grassland meadow, meadow species. Um, so you see it uh, flying in June during the month of late May and June. And, um, but just in that narrow range, it doesn't extend its range south into the forest to any, any ex real extent at all, but just along this uh, very narrow strip of rim habitat. And that's one element that tells us that rim habitats are special features. Uh, the, the, the unique uh, climate at a rim is, is uh, got hot air coming up out of the canyon in the summer, uh, cold air descending at night and uh, all throughout the year, uh, especially in the winter, down into the canyon. So it's a, it's a, it's a very harsh environment. Uh, 
uh, been very unique to uh, to a large deep canyon setting. Good Fascinating. Question. Here's another question. This one's from uh, um, one of our watchers is asking, um, has the water level of the canyon changed over time? The answer to that is really dramatically. Uh, um, according to uh, uh, a, a geologist by the name of Hamblin, uh, that about uh, sometime in the last half million years or so, where you just be standing on the rim of Grand Canyon, you would be looking down into a lake. So uh, that's kind of a big deal. You'd be actually staring at a lake that would have covered over the Tonto platform. Um, uh, Though that lake was created by a, by a lava dam, and the, the dam has since eroded out, dropping the river back to its, uh, its uh, uh, the level that we see it today. So water levels have been all over the board in Grand Canyon from not only big pre-dam floods of half a million CFS or more uh, sweeping, through the, sweeping through the canyon in, uh, in, uh, in uh, recent, fairly recent times, over the last 5,000 years or so, but then also repeated dams that, uh, that block the river and, and, uh, and at least partially fill Grand Canyon with water. Mm, fascinating. Um, another question uh, about the bald eagles. Um, somebody's asking where you might be able to watch for them. Yeah, the, so uh, bald eagles migrate through Arizona. They stop in Grand Canyon to feed on trout. And um, really the only way to see them would be to take a river trip in January or February which is a very cold time of year. We did a lot of research on uh, wintering bald eagles, finding that um, uh, we had concentrations, one point of up to almost 30 birds at, uh, at Nankweep Canyon. So if you were to uh, hike into Nankweep Canyon in late January or, or February, you uh, would probably be able to see bald eagles there. Eagles are really capable migrators. Uh, they breed as far south as Sonora, Mexico, and uh, we have some breeding going on in Arizona as well. But during the winter months, uh, many, many uh, bald eagles come down to uh, lower elevations and lower latitudes. So uh, kind of a large population of Canadian, uh, British Columbian, um, and, uh, and kind of north, uh, northwestern eagles comes through Arizona and into Mexico, and then they go back up to, uh, to, uh, to breed during the summer. So, but uh, the, the peak time for their arrival is late, late February. And I think about the 20th of February is a is the time we see them. If you want to see them migrating southward, then you should go to Yaki Point or Lipen Point in uh, late September, and you'll see bald eagles as well as um, as well as uh, twelve or fifteen other species of raptors that migrate across Grand Canyon and come up. In a, in a future talk, I'll give a talk on on uh, the birds of Grand Canyon, so we can yeah. explore that more. But in late September, go to Lipen Point and sit on the rim with binoculars. And sometimes you'll see a hawk, another individual hawk coming up, uh, reaching the rim about every 45 seconds. Thank you.